Good morning, world. Good morning. So, I saw this article right here. And I'm going to have to give up my friendship with Cedric. This is a damn shame. This may be the last episode of Cedric and Brian you'll ever see. Nah, we're just kidding. <laughs> what do you have to say to Kim McLaren? Kim McLaren, <laughs> you are not going to tell me who I'm going to be friends with, and neither should you. Stay tuned. I'm Cedric. And I'm Ryan. And this is Cedric and Ryan. <laughs> Yep, that is a damn shame, and I, I'm going to echo Cedric. <laughs> the world is getting crazier and crazier every single day. Just when we thought 2022, we were going to sneak in and things would be cool, this crazy stuff happens. So whether you have a black friend, a white friend, a trans friend, whatever type of friend you may have, make sure you're prepared. Folks, are you getting that uneasy feeling about the future? You can't put your finger on it, but you know something big is going to happen soon. And it's not going to be good. Millions of Americans feel that way right now, and they're quietly stockpiling emergency food while they can. Do you have enough emergency food to get you through a sudden crisis? If not, check out My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's number one preparedness company, and they've served millions of American families. Right now, you can save 25% off their popular four-week emergency food kit. You'll enjoy a hearty breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, and snacks, totaling over 2,000 calories a day while everyone else is standing in those food lines. Plus, the food stays fresh for up to 25 years in proper storage, so it will be there when you need it. And by the way things are going, we're probably going to need it much sooner than we think. But don't wait. Go to www.preparewithcedricandbryan.com and claim your four-week emergency food kit now. Don't forget, you'll save 25% if you act right now. That's www.preparewithcedricandbryan.com. Um, this is crazy. Did you, uh, now you told me about this, right? Yeah, you, I heard it on, yeah, I heard it, I was listening to a show and that came on and, and uh, if you read it right here, she's going to be the interim dean at Emerson College. She is the leader of a university. A government indoctrination center. It's, uh, it's, it's Boston, Emerson College. That's a uh, in Boston. But this is the dean of students who is. It, and all this time we keep talking about we gotta unify. We have to come together. But now she's saying that blacks and whites can't be friends. When an author writes a book, uh, normally she does a preview of it, and she'll go to a local bookstore or a Kiwanis Club or a Rotary Club, and she'll read excerpts from the book. But um, we're gonna take a, a video clip of her talking about this book and some of the bull face lies and misconceptions contained within. I'm going to read on, move on to another essay, which <laughs> um, is called Becky and Me. This is about the relationships between white women and black women, for y'all who don't know what Becky refers to. Um, it's a word that uh, black, black folks use for white women. So, <laughs> okay, now you guys heard the term uh, Becky with the good hair. Uh, and again, like you said, it is a, a derogatory term that the people in the, in the POCs, people in, who are black, use as a derogatory term for white woman, Becky. Um, Why? Why Becky? I, I don't know. I just thought maybe because it's a white sounding name. And if that's yeah. the case, then that's pretty racist. But the author's name is Kim. That's not like a ethnic name. Right. I mean, you yeah. could, Kim could be easily be replaced for Becky, it would seem. Right. Kim. <clears throat> and then, and here's the thing that's really, and I'm, I'm playing both sides here. It's okay to call a white woman Becky, but if we were to call her like Taquasia or Shanene, she'd lose her mind. It's like, well, that's racist. You can't do that. But it's like, then why are you doing it? Why is it okay for the black community to say, we're going to call every vanilla white lady that we know and give her a name and call her Becky. But I guess nowadays it's, it's Karen. The whole premise of this, and this is a professor, or not a professor, she's going to be a dean. She's going to be the dean of students. It's already, you know she must promote CRT because she's already promoting segregation. I mean, she's separating people by color mm -hmm. just 
in her talk. And it's funny because the book then is kind of false advertising. Because yeah. it's it seems like it's more of a woman thing. Right. But she immediately breaks into race. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. She goes into deeper detail about the relationship between women. Um, should we go into that? Well, yes. Yeah, but she still does it by race. In the scene from Roots that I most remember, Missy Ann informs Kizzy that she is to become her property. Missy Ann, played by America's then sweetheart Sandy Duncan, is the teenage niece of Dr. William Reynolds, enslaver of the captured African named Kunta Kente, and his daughter Kizzy, played by the great Leslie Uggams. Missy Ann, the name itself is black shorthand for a white woman, a forerunner of Becky, and Kizzy have grown up together. Missy Ann has even secretly taught Kizzy to write and read. She is delighted at the prospect of becoming the legal owner of her friend, Kizzy less so. Among other things, <laughs> among other things, she doesn't want to leave her family. But she knows enough not to voice her displeasure. She faints and feigns until Missy Ann demands an answer. Kizzy, says, says the white woman, pouting, don't you want to be my slave? Aren't you my friend? Okay, there's so many ways we can go with this. Now, before we start filming, Brian asked me about the whole Miss Ann thing. Now, that is a term that was used because my, uh, my maternal grandmother grew up in Alabama and she cleaned homes for a living. And that was just a term, whether it was affectionate or endearing or not, it was a term that most black people housemaids use for the white lady she was working for, Miss Ann. I think a lot of people use, called men, Mr. Charlie. I don't know where those names came from. The white guy was Mr. Charlie, the white woman was Miss Ann. But she's trying to draw a parallel between that classic book by Alex Haley, Roots, which was written how many years ago? Oh, Two? Right. Well, it, well it, 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 it depicts... It depicts 247 years ago. Yeah, 1750s, you told 1750. me. 1750. And she's trying to draw the parallel of what's going on now because uh, Miss Anne, as they call her that, Miss Kizzy, I don't know if she was getting ready to uh, leave or whatever. And so in a way to get her to maintain the friendship, she tried to shame her and said, well, don't you want to stay with me? Don't you want to be my slave? I see nothing. Now, here's the thing. I see nothing wrong with that because... It was 247 years ago. Is it any different today? And as you know, I, I used to be in the school system than kids today who use social media or clothing or athletics or being in drama as ways of separating cliques and finding friends. They are just following the social norms of what happened 247 years ago. What's really bugging me about Kim McLaren's book, I can't find anything that's come up in the last 50 years that she can turn to. Yeah. She had to go back 247 years to, to make an issue out of this. But again, she's she has a book that sounds like it's supposed to be about women, but she immediately goes to race again and then talks about some... I mean, how is Alex Haley supposed to write that script? It took place during slavery. Yeah. So if a young girl says she wants to be a friends with another young girl, and we don't know if this is even true. Mm-hmm. Al, this is Alex Haley's word. So he, the prov- provocative term is... Don't you want to be my slave? Don't you want to be my friend? So she was using it as a parallel to just being a hurt little girl or a young girl mm-hmm. that that thinks she's being rejected by another young girl, right. you know, during a time of slavery. Yeah. Was it a horrible time? Yes. And we've all, in 2021, we all acknowledged that slavery was horrible. And Cedric and I are, we're going to hopefully be doing an episode with a guest later that talks about all the slavery going on today with not only sex slaves but work slaves yes. and organ parts slavery yeah. and uh and, and not to sidetrack but the same person i heard interviewed said that there are more people now and nobody cares there's more people now in slavery indentured for something sex work whatever than through all of the slave trade from africa back in the 17 and 1800s but nobody cares Nobody cares now. Yeah. But then people like this who are in charge of schools are going to now bring, they keep bringing up slavery yeah. today. Yeah. And I love those movies that show that regardless of how, or what color you are, what your background is, when you find two people who are like-minded, not like pigment, not whatever, but like like-minded and they care about each other and, and, and they treat each other with respect, the friendship supersedes all the race. And I think what the problem is with people like this Kim McLaren is they just want to have 
some type of purpose and they miss the 60s they weren't around during the civil rights movement obviously they weren't around during the jim crow era and so they need a fight right right so and that's what you talk about all these uh race hustlers and yep poverty uh, pimps and race hustlers is they need a fight so they just in it's not it's they're taking a fight from at least 50 years ago with the 60s stuff and now 200 and 40 something years ago with slavery and they have to keep regurgitating it yeah and it's just it's sad because like morgan freeman said in an interview that we we did a little parody not a parody but we reenacted we stole it we stole it (laughs) morgan freeman just says how you can get rid of of bigotry stop talking about stop talking about it and not that we don't address it because like i said before i've gone on numerous uh trips back east when we we do uh we go to washington dc and we visit Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello, and they take us down to the, the slave chambers yeah. where the slaves were kept. And he talks about, they talk about Sally Hemings. And one thing that CRT pushes is that we're trying to hide it. We're not, no, we're not trying to hide it. It existed. We know that. But you can't use that as an excuse to say that, well, that's why black people are going to stay oppressed. And that's why white people are going to stay oppressors. Yeah. Well, on that same note, when she talks about the roots, she... But that scene in particular still sliced. Even my daughter felt it. Oh my God, she said. Can you believe that? But by then, I could. So she... She's good at the inflection is great. I know. But she acts like she's... This person acts like she's never talked to her daughter about this right. type of stuff. Right. Oh, my daughter was a guest. It's like, oh my God, this poor daughter, who's biracial, by the way, has to probably listen to all of this stuff, the CRT stuff, in her house. I don't know how... She feels being a biracial. I mean, you have biracial kids. How would you feel if your mom kept coming home and 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 just regurgitating this stuff over and over again? I want you, does she hate half her daughter, or uh, she can't be friends with half her daughter? Yeah, I mean, I, and we don't know. We're putting words in her mouth. We don't know if she hates white people, but she she sure is condescending towards them. And it's it doesn't surprise me that that's her ex husband because. I couldn't imagine, you know, coming home to that. But I wonder if Miss McLaren actually took the time to explain to her daughter, like, yeah, this this movie Roots and the book, they're, they're classics. But you have to understand they're, they're period pieces, mm-hmm. and they happened 247 years ago. And like, yeah, that was awful. Yeah, that was terrible. And yeah, and people shouldn't have been treated that way. But let's fast forward now to 2022. Is it, the racism is nearly as prevalent as she tries to make it is. Right. But like I said before, I, she's a great I, actress. She reads very well, and she she. she embellishes the point that she wants to embellish very well. Well, in the words of Joe Biden, she's a very articulate... <laughs> yes, an articulate, clean black person. You don't see too many of those. Um, I can go back less you know, years and talk about what would happen if I meet a German person mm-hmm. when almost all of the Jews were exterminated less than 250 years ago. Right. You know, 60-something odd years ago, 70-something years ago. But... I'm not going around. I, I want to visit Germany, number right. one. I want to go to the concentration camps to see history. The same reason why you have to keep the stuff at Monticello mm-hmm. so that we can see history. Right. You don't get rid of it. Right. People like this, Kim McLaren, who live their lives just rehashing this, it's just, I actually, <clears throat> when I was listening to this, I actually feel bad for her yeah. because she cannot be a happy person if she lives her life talking this way. Well, Brian makes a good point. People like her, Eva Mix Ken, Kenny, what's his name? Eva Mix Kendi. Kendi, yeah. Um, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson. There is a lot of money in the black community for black people to go around and tell them how blacks are oppressed while they're raking in thousands upon thousands of dollars holding these seminars and symposiums and writing books telling other people that blacks are oppressed. And it's like, it's like they're checking their Rolex watch and say, oh, I'm, I'm late for my next oppression meeting. I better get to it. Yeah. It's big business now. And these, these people like this are capitalized on it. And I'm sure this book is going to sell by the thousands. And unfortunately, that's the case because then it just keeps going on. We never, we never get past this. It's a damn shame. Damn shame. <laughs> All right. Let's watch this last clip. This one we're going to have to pause. <laughs> then there was the Women's March. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the beginning. Um, about how most of my black women friends were like meh about the original Women's March. But the white women were all abuzz. Many of my white colleagues asked if I was going. 
a white woman I did not know and had never met approached me in the CVS. This is true, right downtown. Uh, two things, one there. Whenever somebody says, this is true. This part's true. Then you have to wonder. Some of the stuff I said before this may have been partly true, half truths, but this right here, what I'm getting ready to say next, this is true. But then again, it's, it, it's again this language. My black friends I talked to, and then my white friends, she's, she's segregating her friends. Right. I don't understand that. Right, and I can understand the women's movement because you think this would be a time where all women pull together. Yeah. But, but then, then there's the, the subsection, there's the black women, and there's the white women, but then you're Asian women, you don't really know what we're going through, and you Hispanic women, you have different issues altogether. And so now it, it ceased being about women. Quit, quit talking about black and white. Talk about character. Anyway. If I was going... A white woman I did not know and had never met approached me in the CVS, this is true, right downtown, approached me in the CVS to inquire if I was going. She, like the others, was super excited. For many of them, it was their first march. They'd been busy, I suppose, when we marched when Trayvon Martin was killed, and when Michael Brown was killed, and when Tamir Rice was killed, and when their killers got off. Oh, jeez. <clears throat> the, the condescending attitude, just... But they were busy, I suppose. Well, that's the thing. Well, that... we were out there for Michael Brown, who attacked a cop. Yeah. Should we, do we need to rehash this? The whole Michael Brown thing and Trayvon Martin, and because you know Michael Brown was the whole, the, it was the inception of the whole hands up, don't shoot, which is a lie. If you guys go back and check out that story, he never put his hands up. He never said don't shoot. He and his buddy were walking down the street after they had just robbed a liquor store. The policeman, doing his job as he should have done. Asked them, can I talk to you? And they walked away. And then I believe that's when Michael Brown rushed the car, reached in, tried to extract the gun from the police officer, and then shot him. Yeah. But the media ran with it, but like they ran with every other story, and made it bad cop. Yeah. And so she regurgitates this, trying to make a point, when again, she's bringing up basically criminals again. Right. To make a point. It's It's... How many white criminals are out there that get shot by cops? Because we know that the numbers are actually higher. So, but that never hits anything. Anyway, it's just this lady <laughs> frustrates me. This was killed, and when their killers got off, but they were showing up now, for what? For women. At a dinner party the night before the march, a white woman I did not know told me she had purchased a face mask and armed herself with jugs of milk. I blinked at her. <laughs> Why did you do that? I asked. In case the police attack us, she said. When was the last time you saw police attack a group of white women, I asked. She fumbled through a reply, but we both knew it was ridiculous. <clears throat> I ask you, when was the last time you saw police attack a group of black women that were minding their own business? I've never seen it. And if 2020 was an indication, <clears throat> blacks were allowed to, to break glass, steal things, and take things, and the police did nothing. Now, just think, the police won't bother you as long as you're you're peacefully protesting because of what Chris Cuomo said. He says, what does it say that? Constitution, idiot. Well, but, they're, they were mostly fiery and peaceful protests. Yeah, yeah. And, and she's talking about why did you arm yourselves with, uh, what did she say, milk, milk and, and, and mass? mass. And, she's, and she's laughing because, and that's another thing that BLM, the, that Marxist organization, kind of started among the black community. They're saying that if you are silent, you're complying with the right but if you say something you you better be with us because if you're silent that means you're not with us but it's like well we try and do something but we don't know how to riot where's where's the rioting book where's the, uh, what's what's chapter one what do you take what do you yeah. mean soros will send them the book if they need it uh, <laughs> it's just crazy when was the last time you saw police attack a group of white women i asked <laughs> she fumbled through a reply but we both knew it was ridiculous had she really thought the possibility of danger existed she would not have been leaving her house they won't attack white women, I assured her. They'll probably hand out daisies. Bottles of water, said another black woman friend of mine. Swag, I added. <laughs> By the way, I was not wrong. <laughs> the night of the march. It's different though, but wasn't this administration talking about handing out bottles of water to the, the poor black people who had to stand in line and vote? <laughs> and they said, well, they, they can't do that. Let's, let's, let's give them water and food. The night of the march. I met a lovely middle-aged white woman and her white husband from a white town in white central Massachusetts. I was at a white party, one of three colored folks in the room. She and her neighbor and... Go ahead. She... 
This is a imagine, damn shame. Could you imagine if I'm telling a story? I said, I was talking to my black friend at the black city in a, in a, black, party. At a black party, and I was the only one of three white people there. My question, why in the hell was she there? Why was she there? Why was she, if it was I guess there? it wasn't a white party then. Yeah, if she was there. And apparently there was three three. If you call them colored people, I thought we weren't supposed to use colored yeah. people. I, I yeah. cannot. And you brought up a good point before we started filming. How many people were at this party? Was it 100 people or was it 10? Yeah. Brian can't really see this because when I sent him these clips, he couldn't see it. There's a lot of white people in the crowd. Now, I don't know if the laughter is because they're agreeing with her or it's kind of like... You if know, you those are all the liberal, guilty yeah. white liberals there. Because yeah. if we don't laugh, she's going to lash out at us. From a white town in white central Massachusetts. White town. I was at a white party, one of three colored folks in the room. <laughs> She and her neighbor and their daughters had attended the sister march in downtown Boston, and she was still glowing from the experience. How exhilarating it was, how powerful and connected she felt. What fun. Did she want to talk about police brutality against black people, about systemic racism in the justicism, about segregations in our urban schools? I'm not very political, she said. I nodded. That must be nice. Wasn't that... A woman's march, so why would she even be talking about segregation and police brutality? Well, it was that it was that school in Atlanta, the secondary school, elementary school, where the teacher separated the black kids from the white kids. The segregation is going on, but it's not being done by white people. It's it's being done by black people. They're making the people that are actually in the Klan pretty happy. <laughs> They're doing their job for him. Yeah, but Brian, we want to share this because here's, here's someone who is very high up in academia. Uh, Kim McLaren, she is the dean at Emerson College in Boston. Boston, of all places. Boston. Boston. Forget Boston is it. pretty white. Yeah, it's, it's very white. <laughs> and if anyone has, has seen this, and I, there's some other follow-up videos to this that I, that I watched on my own, and that people are just so behind this woman, what she's doing, that what she is saying is just pure gospel. And I don't understand it. And like, when are we going to get to a point where we're in 2022 now, where we're going to put all this racial rhetoric to the side? And like Brian pointed out earlier, her hypocrisy is, is alarming because her ex-husband is white and now her children are biracial, but she's talking about being careful about being friends with someone who is not your color. It's a damn shame. Damn shame. All right. So don't forget, you can still buy these mugs. They're still out there. They're going fast. And because it's now 2022... Make sure you like, subscribe, and ring that bell. And then do what? And share this video with everyone. I think I'm doing better. You didn't see our last episode. All right, you guys. Thanks for watching that. Uh, hope you had a fantastic new year. Um, our, our prayers to Miss Betty White. Uh, we lost an icon. And John Madden. John Madden. Man, Boom. We lost two biggies. That was just timeline yeah. all right we'll see you guys next time continue being in in all seriousness regardless of your color regardless of what party you're with continue being good to each other until next time i'm cedric and i'm brian see you later.